Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Alyssa Powell and I'm excited to talk about clarinet breathing with you, specifically related to the anatomy and physiology of breathing. Um, in 2019 at Knoxville at the, at the conference, I presented a workshop called um, Making the Clarinet Sing. And um, I kind of was addressing and exploring voice pedagogy and its sort of relationship to clarinet pedagogy and clarinet playing. And one of the topics that I covered just kind of briefly, as that was mostly an overview of kind of what, what was kind of feasible with that topic, was breathing. And many questions kind of came to light, and I've continued to kind of research that over the last couple of years. And this presentation is a result of that research. Um, the slides that I'm showing you today will be available at ica.alyssapowell.co. Um, I know that because we're, we're videotaping today, um, it may be just a little bit difficult to see, so I hope that that helps you view them a little bit better. And so here's kind of the overview of what I'd like to speak about today. Um, what are the, anat or the advantages of addressing anatomy and physiology? What's, what's the point of exploring this topic? You know, what can we gain? Um, how do we need to explore it? Those sorts of things. Um, and then providing just sort of a basic introduction to anatomy and physiology. Obviously that is a really, really big topic, um, but there are definitely things that are applicable today, things you can think about and apply right away that, that um, aren't actually that difficult to conceive of and not difficult to teach either, really. Um, and I'm going to relate all of that back to our breathing pedagogy, kind of what, what we're doing in the clarinet world as far as breathing goes. So here's a great quote from Mr. David Pino. The playing of low soft tones on the clarinet is like a large heavy road roller at work, smoothing out the freshly poured tar onto the roadbed. This machine is doing its job powerfully and yet is moving very slowly indeed. The air does not move rapidly, but still must move with great force. And I like this quote. I think he provides a lot of visualization for the student to kind of latch onto, um, some figurative language that's, that's interesting and um, kind of some sensation-based um, ways to kind of think about breathing that the student can use, right? So these are the ways that we are already thinking about and teaching breathing. Visualization, um, for example, comparing the, the breath to the same as it should be for blowing out a candle, as Daniel Bonat suggests. Um, figurative language, sensation-based. Um, we also kind of talk about anatomy broadly. So blow from your diaphragm. Um, and Michael Webster mentions in the article that this came from, which was from the Clarinet Journal several years ago, that even though he knew you couldn't actually directly blow from your diaphragm, by saying that to students, he still got a good result. So that's very interesting, right? Um, so I think we can continue to, to teach in these ways with our breath builders, straws, spirometers, the great variety that we have and then add anatomy and physiology to kind of round out the understanding of, of the topic of breathing for our students. So what do we have to gain from our use of anatomy and physiology? Number one is communication and clarity with the student. So the student asking a question will have more um, terms and specific ideas in mind, the teacher responding, um, will we'll have the same, and they can have the same language, so it's a little bit easier to understand between the two. Um, what I've found is there are just hundreds of words that are used differently um, and the same, but different words um, in breathing. So for example, tummy, stomach, abs, abdomen, abdominal region, belly, ab muscles, abdominal viscera, diaphragm, all might be used to um, sort of talk about the exact same part of the body with the student, but actually are all very different parts of the body or kind of ways of thinking about the body. So we know that we cannot physically breathe into our stomach, or if we do, that's really not comfortable and, and not useful. Um, but also, you know, similarly saying the tummy or abdominal region, that may kind of cause the student to think about breathing a little bit differently or that area of their body differently. So kind of unifying those terms can be really, really helpful um, for the student. This can also help us lead to more specific application of breathing methods, right? If the student knows the parts of their body well, then they can, you know, ask better questions. They can apply what they're doing as they breathe in another way. Another way, not always a better way, but another way from what they may have already been doing. Um, 
immediately when doing this research, I had in my head, you know, snippets of advice and suggestions from former teachers and realized all the different methods of breathing that I've been taught. And so at times in my life, I've had a clarinet teacher, a voice teacher, a band teacher, a choir teacher, and all are suggesting different things. So it's really important to be able to actually recognize that we have different methods. There's not just one right method. There's a lot of methods that work for a lot of different people. Um, a voice pedagogue, Richard Miller, details in his book more than 14 specific and distinct methods of breathing used by different people in, um, in Western music. That's a lot of methods. They're not all compatible, right? So um, it's really important to be able to recognize those and, um, and see how our method kind of fits in that, in that kind of category. We have the opportunity to unify within our field. Um, let's, let's pick some terms and explain them and really give some definitions and kind of make that more of the understood term. I think that would be very beneficial and is already done to some extent with some of these terms in a medical way. Um, it's also done, you know, by other performers of music and um, I know it's looked at a lot in brass, the tuba, you know, um, tuba, tubas have a, a rich history of breathing examination um, as do voice pedagogues. So important to kind of examine that and create that unity for us. Um, we can also compare, you know, our kind of pedagogical trajectory to that of the voice. So um, the reason that's kind of significant to me is they began looking at the human body in an anatomical way as early as 1860 with the invention of the laryngoscope by uh, Manuel Garcia II. And I mean, that's 1860. So um, since that time, they have kind of been at the forefront, perhaps because there's no instrument barrier between them and sort of the medical equipment. You know, that's, that's kind of unique to singers, that they don't have anything, all that, all that equipment that's, that works for medical purposes is already suited to the human body for singing, really, in a lot of cases. Um, so we can kind of take their lead on, you know, well, yes, for hundreds of years, we used visualization, figurative language, sensation-based teaching, and now we're using anatomy and pedagogy. I think now uh, clarinetists can do the same if we'd like. So let's talk a little bit about respiration. Let's get into it. So we've got the skeleton, um, the organs of respiration, and then we have muscles of, of respiration, which include inhalation and exhalation. So here to start are the skeletal portions that are kind of most relevant for us. Um, the thorax, which is another word for the rib cage, and the cavity within, so that kind of space within where the heart and lungs reside is called the thoracic cavity. So I'll mention that word quite a few times. Um, so we have the ribs, we have the costal cartilages, which are really important by the way, they're kind of there in blue. Very important because they allow for the flexing and changing of the shape of the thoracic cavity and the thorax as a whole. And that's really important. That's, that's kind of what allows us to breathe, actually. That flexing is, is essential. Um, we have the sternum and then um, the xiphoid process here, the lowermost tip, which is what the diaphragm actually connects to, in part, also some of the cartilages. But that really has strong implications for the importance of our posture in related to breathing, right? So. Um, you know, the sternum being lowered is going to affect how the diaphragm works. The sternum being, being raised is going to affect how the, diaphragm, how the diaphragm interacts. So that's important to remember as well. And at the top of the picture, there are the clavicles, also known as the collarbones. Um, those are not actually part of the thorax, but they're included because I will talk about clavicular breathing at the end of this um, presentation. So here are some of the organs of the thoracic cavity. Um, I'm going to remove the sternum here, um, and there you can still see in very, very pale blue the costal cartilages and then the ribs. And now here are the lungs, as well as the trachea, which is at the top, which connects to the bronchial tubes and the bronchial trees, leading to the alveoli air sacs. There's the heart and the pulmonary and cardiovascular vessels as well, all of which are encased and protected by the thorax.
All right, so that brings us specifically to the lungs, now that we kind of see how that is in conjunction with the rest of the body. So they're organs, they're not muscles, and that's really important to remember. They cannot move of their own accord, but are actually manipulated by other muscles in the body. Um, their tissue that's described often as spongy, made of the millions of alveoli air sacs. Um, and then we can see there also we have the bronchial tubes, which lead to the trachea, which leads to the larynx. Um, the larynx, of course, refers to the voice box, um, so that's important to recall. And the trachea is um, partially comprised of cartilage. And this is important because that means that it has some flexibility. So as we breathe, the trachea may have a little gentle pull in it. And, and one of the theories that is um, brought up in his resource, um, uh, Your Voice and Inside View, by Dr. Scott McCoy, who's a, who's a great voice pedagogue, um, one of his suggested um, theories about the trachea is that as you breathe in and the trachea gently pulls down, it tugs ever so slightly on the larynx and helps create a more open throat. So when you think about how we're teaching a student to work on open throat, right, instead of just isolating saying you need to open your throat and use these muscles or think about the larynx or whatever, it actually could be more of a product of breathing and we could address that more with a more holistic approach to breathing, realizing the, the connection that the lungs are connected to the bronchial tubes, connected to the trachea, connected to the larynx. All of that is kind of a more holistic way of thinking about that idea. They're surrounded by the pleural membranes. And these membranes, um, the outermost membrane, interacts directly with the thoracic cavity. And with the expansion and contraction of the thoracic cavity, there's this gentle pull on those membranes that also pulls the lungs with them. That's kind of the motion of the lungs. It's um, quite delayed, really, when you think about it. It's not, it's not very direct. Um, Boyle's law is an important concept related to breathing. Um, Boyle was a 17th century scientist, and he discovered that with a closed container, the volume and pressure are inversely related. So that means if you have a container and it becomes smaller, the volume is decreasing because it's becoming smaller. The pressure inside is greater. And so for breathing, that's really important um, for us. Um, as you see, we have the inspiration here. The blue arrows show the air coming in. And so the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles, those are muscles between your ribs, the external intercostals, the diaphragm contract. This causes the thoracic cavity to expand a bit which allows for a lower pressure inside the thoracic cavity than in the atmosphere, and air pours in. And the opposite is true for expiration. So as the diaphragm relaxes, the external intercostal muscles relax, and the, the space becomes smaller, we have more pressure that moves the air out of the body, out into the atmosphere. Um, something else I'd like to point out in this particular picture is you can see the diaphragm moving, and it's not a very big difference in motion, right? The diaphragm kind of goes from, from curved, as it is here when it's relaxed, to kind of more straight, and then it would go back to kind of curved, right? So it's not kind of like an elevator moving from the bottom of the ribs or below the belly button. Um, I think when teachers um, believe that that's what the diaphragm is doing, what they're really feeling <laughs> actually, is the gentle displacement of the abdominal viscera. Uh, the abdominal viscera are the um, organs housed in the kind of upper abdominal area. So the diaphragm sort of separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And as it flexes, it gently presses on those organs, right? And we feel that just a little bit. And you can feel that kind of all the way through your abdominal area, really, that sort of displacement of those organs, but that's very different than the diaphragm moving in the body kind of like an elevator. So that's just good to kind of realize. So what do we need for an excellent exhalation um, for playing the clarinet? Right, this is different than what we require from an exhalation if we're sitting on the couch. So we are actually interacting with muscles. We are choosing which ones to use and how and and all of that. So, but what do we need? We really need a steady, nice air stream that's easy to control. We need it to have a long duration. And we need it to provide, we need it to come from a healthy source 
that's something that we can do for a long period of time, right? That, you know, this is a part of our lives, our whole lives. Um, so we need to choose muscles that, that have that longevity and can do that for a long time. So kind of thinking about the exhalation specifically for music, specifically in this case for singing, but, but that I think is very, very adaptable um, and adoptable for clarinet, um, is Dr. Scott McCoy's book, Your Voice and Inside Views, an excellent resource um, that he really examines the anatomy and physiology as well as kind of the pedagogy of some ideas surrounding, um, surrounding breathing. Really, really fascinating. Um, and he had access to a lot of equipment um, in his lab that allowed him to sort of explore, um, explore these things really hands-on and kind of, you know, figure out what really made sense for the human voice for breathing. It's really remarkable research. So I just have to say that a lot of um, these ideas kind of stem from my understanding of, of, of this um, body of knowledge that he is a part of. So here's another view of our primary breathing muscles. This is a beautiful painting uh, from the 1700s, actually. Um, here you can see the external intercostal muscles. The internal intercostal muscles reside on the inside of the external intercostal muscles. So they're just kind of in layers. Um, the external help open the rib cage. The internal help close the rib cage, right? It doesn't move that much, but that's, that's kind of the motion. Um, and then we have the diaphragm here. And as you can see, the ribs would come around and be in front of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is not, you know, so below the rib cage that, that kind of would come around there. And here are some of the primary breathing muscles for the exhalation. There you can see the basic skeletal structure, right? The top of the pelvis, <clears throat> the spine, and the lower part of the ribs. And so here we have the external obliques on the sides of our bodies. Then we have the internal obliques, which tuck in kind of just inside those. All of these work in kind of pairs, helping us to create muscular antagonism. Um, we have the quadratus lumbarum here in blue. And then the transverse abdominis and the rectus abdominis. And so there's the rectus abdominis. And so um, what I just mentioned was um, muscular antagonism. So what I mean by that is, as, as one muscle contracts, we're using another muscle to kind of fight it, um, to kind of maintain the air so that it doesn't escape right away. So when we inhale um, through muscular antagonism, we kind of maintain some of the motion or feeling of the inhalation so that the air doesn't rush out. We don't have a relaxed exhalation. We're fighting that, that kind of natural urge through these um, primary breathing muscles, right? Um, so here are some of the secondary breathing muscles. Now it's really important to consider these as well because we can do a lot of breathing with them, but it may not be the best means for health and longevity of the performer, right? So these are a lot of smaller muscles as you can see. The trapezius is quite large, but um, interacts perhaps less with the diaphragm than the other abdominal muscles do that I was um, showing in the previous slide. So we have the sternocleidomastoids, the levator scapula, the scalene muscles, and the trapezius. Um, here we also have the pectoralis major. There's just um, more pictures of also secondary breathing muscles. The pectoralis minor, the serratus anterior, kind of on the sides, um, the innermost intercostal muscles, um, our latissimi dorsi, the rhomboid muscles, levator scapula, and then the gluteus maximus. And that one's interesting. Some teachers do really instruct students to use the gluteus maximus to help kind of counter, I think it's countering tension really. So with that muscular antagonism, we create a little bit of tension and um, we kind of have to address that or kind of put that tension somewhere in our body. And, and the gluteus maximus tends to be, for some teachers, they, they have great success with that. Um, similarly, the, the pelvis muscles or the pelvic floor muscles um, are also addressed by some teachers. Um, it seems to be particularly beneficial or perhaps um, 
effective rather for women, perhaps because the shape of the pelvis is different between men and women. So that's something to consider as well when thinking about breathing. Um, you know, we have to consider that there may be some, you know, physical characteristics that are different student to student, and, and we can address that with anatomy and physiology. So what this really provides us, anatomy and pedagogy, um, we have these muscle options. If you have a student that has an injury, perhaps they need to kind of learn to breathe a different way. You can actually help them with that, you know, without it being um, a really complicated situation. It, you know, there's, there's possibilities for different options of use of muscles. We can establish more firm breathing methods. So it's not just that everybody in each studio across the world, around the country, you know, everybody breathes according to their teacher, but, but we don't understand how each other breathes, you know, kind of across the board. We can have a little bit more of, metho you know, methodical understanding of that. We've got these terms. They're already established by medical professionals. We've got some voice pedagogy terms that are established for breathing methods. These things are there to be used, you know, adapted and used. Um, so it's just nice to, to realize that. And then we have our primary and secondary breathing muscles. We can really consider which is best for the health and longevity of the player. And, um, and always considering our unique situation of holding this, you know, four-ish pound instrument while we are playing and, and producing beautiful music. So here are some of the breathing methods um, that are described by Dr. McCoy and are pretty standard within the voice um, pedagogy. Um, we have clavicular breath which is a high breath, right? And it uses a lot of the smaller muscles kind of in the upper chest and maybe in the neck. Um, it, it ends up providing the student a lot of air, a lot of pressure, but not very much control and perhaps causes them to rely on the larynx to help control that air. And I don't really know of any clarinet teachers that particularly suggest this kind of breathing, but I see it all the time in my middle school and high school students. Um, thoracic breathing is expansion in the outer or in the rib cage. So we're kind of low in the rib cage, expansion down there. Um, and it's sort of the antagonism occurs between the internal and external intercostal muscles. So the, the rib cage is kind of fighting with itself to relax on the exhalation. Um, that's kind of where that antagonism and breath support comes from. Abdominal breath seems to be the most common for clarinet teachers. As I've continued to read and study, it seems very, very common. This seems to be what we're advocating. So basically, whatever muscle you relax in the abdominal area on the inhalation is kind of where the breath will go, and then that's kind of where the antagonism happens on the exhalation. So if I relax the rectus abdominis while I breathe in, then when I breathe out, then I'm going to have some muscular antagonism there. I might push out a little bit or pull in, depending on the teacher. And, um, and that antagonism provides me with the support and control I need to, to keep my air under control. That's really a universal breathing method, though. You can also do the same in the um, obliques. And if you do a small amount of expansion and a small amount of sort of tension on the release, that's the inner tube breath. We also have the balance breath or appoggio which is a very popular breathing type for, um, for singers. And it's actually a combination of thoracic and abdominal. And so here you can kind of have the chest expands on the inhalation, and then the abdominals kind of provide the antagonism on the exhalation, or the opposite, the abdominals expand on the inhalation, and the chest muscles, or sorry, the thoracic muscles, um, provide the um, antagonism on the exhalation. And some teachers are proponents of that. Michael Webster spoke very highly of it in some of his articles. Um, Reiner Vela describes it quite well. And Keith Stein's sort of holistic breathing method um, really kind of also follows the appoggio sort of mentality or, or method. So I hope we've learned today that it's possible to learn the basic anatomy and physiology it's not, you know, it's not that difficult. There, there are things that hopefully you saw today that you can apply right away or think about right away or mention to your students. Um, it really has the potential to help us clarify our own technique and, and of course, then that of our students. And we have the ability to meet the needs of, of more students this way. You know, that really technically minded student that's, you know, really into science, 
perhaps this will help them realize their breathing method and um, sort of how they're using their body for music more wholly. Um, we can unify our field, you know, by, by addressing these terms, especially really unifying terms could be extremely beneficial, I think, just across the whole clarinet field in general. Um, for future, future research, I really hope that we can use some medical equipment for clarinet breathing and continue to kind of explore it in that regard um, with, you know, some minor adaptations of the equipment to, to make it, you know, useful for us and to continue to examine how the muscles of um, respiration interact with the muscles that we use to hold the clarinet, you know, and, you know, our arm muscles, even our embouchure muscles, how those are all kind of holistically related, I think, could be very beneficial as well. Here are a few significant resources. I've already mentioned Your Voice and Inside View by Dr. Scott McCoy. Um, English, French, German, Italian Techniques of Singing by Richard Miller is fantastic. Um, I'm very grateful for all of the resources that are carefully um, detailed in this presentation for their public domain images, which is quite a challenge with this topic. And if you're more curious, continuing to be curious about how the clarinet and singing are related, um, my, my final document from The Ohio State University is now published, and um, it would be great if you read or look at any of those resources. I'd love to hear from you and see what you think about them. Please don't hesitate to email me at clarinet at alyssapowell.co. Um, this research is really important to me, so it would be, be fantastic to make this somewhat interactive and hear what you have to say as well. Thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you so much to the artistic team of ICA. You guys have done such tremendous work, and, and we're all very grateful, so thank you.